Hi, everybody. I'm so sorry that I couldn't be here with you in person today. And I'm sorry for myself because coming together on Sundays really is the highlight of my week. I love getting to worship the Lord with you. But because of circumstances beyond our control, we couldn't be here in person with you this week. So my family's okay, we're okay, and we'll be back together next week. Last week, we started out our new series in the book of Philippians, and Dan reminded us of what it means to experience a joyful life. If you didn't get a chance to watch that message, I'd recommend you go back and check it out so that you can follow along with this whole series. Next week, Pastor Jordan is going to take us back to chapter two of Philippians, which really is the high point of the whole letter. But today we're going to skip ahead and we're going to move over to chapter three, where we learn what it means to know God and to really push on and persevere with him. And personally, I think a message of pressing on and perseverance is quite relevant for Mother's Day. So fellow moms out there, I feel you and I salute you. If you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. And I'm going to read the first 14 verses for us here. Paul says this, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord for us today. And so we say, thanks be to God. I'll say up front that there's a lot in this passage and there's lots of places we could go with it. So we're not going to get to cover everything we just read about today. And I'll also say this, because in this passage, there's a lot we've probably heard before. If we've been Christians for a while, we hear Paul talking about God's grace, about depending on his righteousness and not our own. He talks about persevering. He talks about joy. And if we've been in the church, we've probably talked about these things. We've probably read about them before. But that's why I love the way that Paul starts this passage out. He says, it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again and again. It's actually a safeguard for your faith. Paul here isn't worried about coming up with something new and flashy. He doesn't feel a need to have fresh content. He simply reminds us of what is true. And you and I need that repetition. After a week of hearing the news cycle or being on social media, We need to come to church on Sunday and be reminded that our God is actually on the throne. After a day of of parenting, taking care of kids, or slogging through work, we can come home and we can pick up our Bibles and read with Paul as he reminds us to rejoice in the Lord. 
Paul, throughout all of his letters in the New Testament, is always taking joy in the good news of God's story, the gospel. He repeats it to people over and over, and he's rejoicing in the things that God has done for us. So before we get too far into our message, I want us to take a moment to stop and to rejoice in the good news of the gospel. I'm going to repeat for us the beautiful promise of God's story, summarized here by one of my favorite authors, Christopher Wright. He summarizes the gospel this way. The God of Israel, who is the only true and living God, has been faithful to his covenant promise, originally made to Abraham, and then amplified and testified all through the law and the prophets. In and through the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, God has decisively acted to deal with the problems of human sin and division. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, according to the scriptures, God has borne our sin and defeated its consequences, enmity and death. And in Christ's exaltation to God's right hand, the reign of God is now active in the world so that we now live under the kingship of Christ. Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, is Lord, God, and Savior of the world. So turn from your futile idols to the living God who alone can save you. Repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. This good news is what we are rejoicing in today. Whatever burdens we've come to church with, whatever our week was like, whether or not we feel happy today, this is the joy that we have. So church, rejoice in the Lord. Our God has been faithful to keep his promises. He's provided a way for us, and he's now reigning. I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. As we read through Philippians 3, we learn a lot about Paul and his life, actually, a lot about who he was as a person. He explains his background to us, all of the reasons that he had to put confidence in the flesh. We'll see it up here on the screen, how he was a Hebrew, he was a Pharisee from the tribe of Benjamin, Paul was circumcised at the right time, he kept the law. The main point that Paul is making for us is this, he was both ethnically and religiously pure. Paul is a person who was at the top of his class. Paul tells us that if we have any questions about how zealous he was for God, we should remember that he was part of the group that was persecuting the church. We could go back to Acts chapter 8, and we read there about Stephen, the first person who's martyred for his faith in Jesus. Acts tells us that Paul was there, and he approved of Stephen being murdered. And then it says that Paul went on to destroy the church. He would drag men and women out of their homes and he would put them in prison because they believed in Jesus. When we hear this, it's easy for us to think of Paul maybe as this bloodthirsty tyrant, but I actually think it's important for us to recognize that Paul does all of these things because of his deep commitment to God. At that time, he didn't know Jesus. He thought that Christians were preaching a false doctrine a false gospel that was actually pointing people away from God's true story. Paul is trying to protect the faith. A few weeks ago, we spent time in our Lamentations series, and we saw how God's people had been so terribly disobedient for so long that it led to Babylon coming in and exiling them. They were punished for their sin because they had worshipped false gods, they had treated people poorly, they had ignored God's law. After about 70 years of exile, God's people are allowed to come back into their land. And because of this brutal experience, really for the first time in their history, they, they kind of wake up and they're like, oh, maybe God was serious when he said that we should obey him, that we should follow his law. And so in between the Old and New Testaments, you start to see this happen. People start to obey God. They start to do the things that he's asked of them, really for the first time in their history. They start to worship him alone, and they even start to form these groups, people like the Pharisees, whose purpose is to help the people walk in God's way, to make sure that they're doing everything that they're supposed to do. 
So by the time of Jesus and by the time of Paul, there's been this huge shift in how people think and act. In fact, they've gone overboard because now the Pharisees have added all of these extra rules, all of these extra laws onto God's people, things that God had never asked them to do. And so following God has become burdensome. It's become difficult for the people. This is Paul's background, and it's what's influenced his beliefs, and it's why, for so long, we see him in the book of Acts persecuting Christians. He sees them doing something that he truly believes is heretical and is opposed to God. But then Paul meets Jesus. He's walking along on the road to Damascus, off to persecute some more Christians. And this blinding light comes down from heaven and he hears a voice, Jesus speaking. And he says to him, why do you persecute me? Paul meets Jesus there and it changes him forever. From then on, Paul realizes that Jesus is the answer to all of God's promises. Jesus is the pinnacle of God's story. And so because of Jesus, because he has had this experience with him and met him, Paul is willing to press on in his faith, whatever may come. And it's not going to be easy for Paul. He suffers beatings. He has terrible enemies. He sits in prison. Eventually, Paul dies for his faith in Jesus. But Paul tells us that it's all worth it. And in fact, he finds joy in it. And I think there's a few reasons and a few ways that Paul is able to find joy in his perseverance. And the first would be this. Paul knows that he belongs to God. At the beginning of Philippians, Paul introduces himself and his friend Timothy as slaves of Christ Jesus. The NIV and maybe some other versions you read will say servants. But if you look at the Greek, it's actually much more correct to use the word slave. So here we have Paul who many would argue has discovered freedom from the law, who has kind of thrown off the burden of all those Jewish regulations, and yet he willingly is calling himself a slave. That word has lots of negative connotations for us. It would have had negative connotations for Paul. In the Roman world, a slave was someone who had no rights. They were dispensable. A slave was property, not a person. And yet here Paul uses the language of slavery to describe his relationship with Jesus. You and I probably prefer when Jesus calls us friends. That's how we want to define our relationship with him. So why does Paul embrace this term? Well, I always think a lot of it goes back to Exodus, just like so many things in the Bible. In the book of Exodus, God's people are enslaved in the land of Egypt. They're suffering under the Pharaoh, and he's this harsh and cruel master. And over and over in the text, the Hebrew reminds us that they are serving and that they are slaves to Pharaoh. They cry out for rescue, and God remembers them. He acts on their behalf. God makes all of these promises to Israel, and then we read him send all these plagues, and he brings them out from under the yoke of the Egyptians with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. The Israelites are set free. And on the shores of the Red Sea, they declare that God reigns, that he is the one who is in charge. And there the Hebrew text tells us that they are now free to serve, which in Hebrew is the same word as slave, the one true God. They have been enslaved under the wrong master, the Pharaoh of Egypt. And now... They have been set free to live and to serve under God, who is a righteous and good and just master. This is Paul's mindset. This is his history. This is his story. He serves the one true God. He's experienced his salvation, and now his whole life is devoted to service of him. But still, even knowing all of this, I I buck against the idea of being enslaved to anyone, to anything. But then I stop and think about my life day to day. 
I think about the amount of time I spend working, the amount of time I spend on my phone, the amount of time I spend being angry at someone who's wronged me, pursuing money, online shopping, thinking about how I look, whatever that may be. And I realize that I spend a whole lot of time serving something. We spend much of our lives enslaved. It's just usually to the wrong master. I'm in a book club right now, and we're reading a book called You Are Not Your Own. It's by a guy named Alan Noble. If you're in that book club, by the way, I recommend you close your ears for this part because I read ahead. This book takes a deep dive into our current culture and all of the ways that we are encouraged as a people to believe that we belong to ourselves. We're supposed to figure out our goals and our identity and what makes us tick, because if we, if we figure that out, that's what's ultimately going to make us happy. But the book talks about how that doesn't seem to be working very well for us today, because instead of becoming happy, lots of us are just anxious or dissatisfied. And the remedy to this, the author says, is that we need to have a true and deep understanding of the fact that we are not our own, but we belong to Christ. This isn't a new concept. Dan talked about it a few weeks ago, actually. It comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, which is this statement of faith that was written way back in the 1500s. But Paul understands and is able to operate out of this truth. He's not his own. He belongs to Jesus. He realizes he was bought at a price through the blood of Christ. And and that God has purchased him, but that purchase doesn't actually just make him property that God is controlling. Alan Noble says it this way in his book. He says, God's ownership of his children is categorically different because our humanity is no threat to his sovereignty. On the contrary, he designed us to worship and to belong to him as people. When God purchases us, it actually elevates us. When we become his slaves, we also become heirs with him to reign with him in his kingdom. We are a people who were created by God in his image. We were actually designed at the core of our being to worship and to love and to serve him. It's what we were intended for, and it's what we were meant to do, and it's actually where we will find our joy. It's kind of an upside-down concept, but it's true. If I belong to God, then I will find true joy in serving him and in serving others. Because it's at my very being, it's my identity. It's why, of course, why after the service, I'll go out into the foyer and I'll check out all the options there are for serving. We need more people to to serve our kids upstairs. We need more people to host groups. Well, of course I will participate in that. It's who I am. It's my identity as a follower of Jesus. And when we belong to God... We are a people who are willing to do the things that God has asked us to because we trust his way, but also simply because we trust our God. We're willing to press on in the things that he asks us to do, even when those things are difficult. Because the truth is that some of us will be called to persevere and to belong to God in jobs that we love. And other of us will be asked to do that in jobs where we find no purpose. Some of us belong to God in easy marriages and others in difficult ones. God might call us to give our money away freely, to bring our sexual desires under his will. And God might call us to cling to him, to barely persevere as we struggle through cancer or infertility or the loss of a loved one. When we belong to God, our joy doesn't come from our circumstances or from obeying God in the hopes of of getting a reward from him. It comes from living out the way that we were designed to be, where our humanity is most fully displayed 
as slaves of the king who shed his own blood for us, who gives us power through the Holy Spirit to live for him, and who invites us to one day reign with him. Another reason I think Paul is able to persevere is that because he desperately wants to know Christ more. Paul realizes that in order to do this, he's going to need to press on with Jesus, whatever may come, whether it's suffering or glory, life or death. There's something about perseverance that actually works to to grow our faith and to refine us. And so that's why the book of James tells us that when we face troubles, we're actually to consider it joy. Because as we press on, it'll grow that perseverance in us. And it's, it's going to help us become more mature, more complete in Christ. Pressing on tests our faith. And it helps us to discover more about God's character in the tough times. And then it brings us joy because we've gotten to know him better through it. I'm going to tell you a little story about perseverance, because I once decided to run a half marathon. And it was horrible, because running is horrible. Now, I know some of you will disagree with me, because I see you. I see you running by my house with smiles on your faces, pretending like you're having fun. I don't buy it. I'm not a runner. My dad was a runner. He was a long distance runner. He got all of his college paid for on scholarships to run cross country. And he was pretty good. He, his fastest mile was four minutes and 10 seconds. And he would, during the summer, do training for cross country. And so he would run around the city of Minneapolis. He'd run 22 miles a day in just a couple of hours. No big deal. I, on the other hand, I hate running. I hate it. I'm very slow. I find it quite painful. I've never once found that supposed euphoria that that runners feel. But for some reason, many years ago, I decided that I should be a runner. It was in my blood. My dad did it. So I decided I I was going to run a half marathon. So I signed up for one at the end of the summer. And I trained all summer long. I went running. I did weight training. I would do a long run every weekend and and add to those miles. In this whole time, I never once enjoyed it. I didn't. But I did press on. So finally, we we got to the day of the race. Races are always super early in the morning. And and I get there and, you know, all the, the true runners are already there. And they're excited and they're busy running their warm-ups because they can't wait to get going. And I'm over in a corner, huddled up, trying to get in a nap before I have to start the race. The day of the race was beautiful. We were in Colorado. We're at the base of Pikes Peak. And and I tried to have a good attitude. And I thought, okay, maybe this will be okay. Maybe this will actually be fun. We start the race and things are going okay. All the true runners, you know, move ahead and pass me quickly fine, because I didn't want to hang out with you anyway. But then, you know, some of the older people start to pass me by. Then the moms pushing strollers uphill wave as they go on. At one point, I look down, and there's an injured turtle trotting along ahead of me, looking up at me with sympathy. I'm being a little dramatic, but not very dramatic. This was a slog for me. It was super hard. It took a lot of training. It took a lot of hard work. But I did it. I ran all 13.1 miles. I crossed that line eventually. And my dad, the runner, even flew out to watch me do it. Training for and running that half marathon was not fun for me. But I can tell you that there was joy in it. There was joy in the practice and in the commitment, in the doing something that I decided to do and following through with it. There was rejoicing as I finally crossed crossed that line, as I finished the thing that I had started. And there was joy for me in having my dad there watching. He knew the hard work that it had taken for me to get to that point. 
as I trained, as I finally limped across the finish line. He was proud of what I'd done, and he found joy in it. The book of Colossians tells us that that God is proud when we persevere. It pleases him when we endure through his strength. That endurance leads us to joyful thanks for the things that God has done for us. When we press on and when we run the race, we get trained in the things of God and we get to know him better. We start to delight in the things that he delights in. We press on, like Paul did, in order to know our God. The last reason I think that Paul was so willing to persevere is that he was a person who had experienced God's grace. Paul belongs to God and he wants to know him better, but he tells us here that he's still working on it. Um, Verses 13 and 14 say, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What are the things that Paul is forgetting, the things that he has to put behind him? Well, I think this goes a couple of ways. As we saw from that list of achievements, Paul was this this top-notch Christian. He had spent his whole life following God and doing what God has asked. He was pure and he was blameless when it came to obedience. Paul is a person who could have easily convinced himself that he was worthy of God, that he was worthy of heaven. I think this is true for lots of us. We might deny it, but it's easy for us to find our value and our righteousness in the things that we do in the way that we're seen. Some of us can look back on our lives and we can say honestly that that we have walked with Jesus pretty much our whole lives. I became a Christian when I was five. I remember it vividly. I was in my bedroom with my mom. I prayed with her to Jesus, asking him to forgive me of my sins. And overall, when I look at my life, there have been ups and downs. But I can say that I have learned my Bible, I've attended church, I have served, and I have tried to be a person who has built my life around the things of God. And that's a good thing. I'm grateful for that in my life. But where it can become a danger to me is when I start to rest on those things, a righteousness of my own, as Paul puts it. Instead of a desire to do all of those things in order to know Christ better. And so even this very week, I had to stop and I had to ask myself, do I learn scripture? Do I teach? Do I serve and do I host? Because I want to appear a certain way in front of all of you. Or do I do it because I love Jesus and because I want to serve him and I want to get to know him better? Our motives in this can be hidden, even to to ourselves. And so when my pride starts to creep in, or when I desire to do well for the sake of achievement, a passage like Philippians 3 grounds me in what is true. Because the reality is that all of my goodness is garbage, as Paul puts it. It means nothing compared to actually being found in Jesus to re- in resting on his righteousness alone. Because nothing I do, no amount of good works or service, is ever going to make me pure enough to stand before a holy God. This is what Paul has realized, and it's why his accomplishments no longer motivate him. He's met Jesus. He's realized that he needs Jesus. And now he just wants to get to know him better and better. And then there's the other side of the coin, the other things that Paul needs to put behind him. And those would be his failures. Because Paul is a person who didn't recognize Jesus when he first heard about him. Instead, Paul went around persecuting and jailing 
and watching the murder of Christians. Jesus shows up on that road to Damascus and he speaks to Paul and he asks him, why are you persecuting me? Paul is the persecutor of Jesus himself. The guilt and the shame of this, it could have buried Paul. I imagine Paul sitting alone in one of those jail cells and the enemy sneaking in and whispering in his ear, reminding him of how he had failed, how he had abused and and persecuted God's people. How on earth could Jesus ever use him for good when he had failed him so badly? Some of us have guilt and shame because of the things that we've done. We have lived spectacularly messy lives, full of sin and mistakes and failures. We have grieved God through our actions. And just so you know, those of us who might appear righteous have done the exact same things. They've just been behind the scenes. We've grieved the Lord through our thoughts, through our secret sins. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. When we are honest, all of us have crushing shame because of our failures before God. Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of his glory. So what's the solution for Paul when he feels that weight of his guilt? It's the same as when he's tempted to feel pride in his achievements. He rests on the grace of Jesus. Nothing that we have done in our past and nothing we can do in our future can ever keep us from the love of God and the salvation that he offers to us in Christ. When we accept that it's Jesus who's taken on the punishment for our sin and rescued us from it, we then realize that when God looks at us, he sees the spotless righteousness of his son. Psalm 32 says it beautifully. You forgave me and all my guilt is gone. I've mentioned before that I love reading this Bible. It's called Immerse. In it, they've taken out the chapter and verse marking. So when you read a letter like Philippians, it reads like a letter, not like a reference book. When you read the New Testament in the Immerse Bible, they've reordered Paul's letters. In our regular Bibles, all of Paul's letters are organized just from the longest one to the shortest one. But in the Immerse Bible, they've arranged them chronologically. So you read the letters to the Thessalonians first, because those were the first ones written. And at the very end, you read 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter. When you read the Bible this way, it's, it's easier to see this progression in Paul, to see him as a real person, as he faces his hardships, as he realizes he's come to the end of his journey. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes to his friend Timothy, and he asks him to come visit him in Rome as soon as he possibly possibly can. The emperor Nero has started persecuting Christians, and Paul knows that he is unlikely to be released from prison. He knows that he is going to die there in Rome. And so in his last letter, Paul writes to his close friend, Timothy, and he says this. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Whenever I read this passage from the end of Paul's life, I think about him as a little boy, how he would have spent so much time memorizing God's word, hearing about all the promises that one day God would send a Messiah to make right all the things that we have made wrong. I see Paul as that young Pharisee, persecuting the church so that he can serve his God because he wants to follow him. I see him in the book of Acts as he hears that voice from Jesus, sees that blinding light. He has his whole world turned upside down as he realizes what he's been missing. 
and then our zealous Paul doesn't miss a beat. He devotes all of his energy into telling people the good news about Jesus. His whole life is now dedicated to advancing God's story, to playing his part well for the sake of the kingdom. Paul walks countless miles to bring the good news to those who don't know it. He receives vicious lashings. He gives amazing speeches to authorities. He writes letters to Christians to both correct and encourage. Paul casts out demons. Paul sits in cold, dark prison cells. Paul pressed on. He ran his race and he finished it well. Paul says that his prize is awaiting him. And I picture him meeting Jesus, the same Jesus Paul had persecuted, the same Jesus who blinded him on that road. I see the Lord greeting Paul and welcoming him home. Well done, good and faithful servant. Paul finished his race and he got to meet his master, his friend. Jesus. And that's why we press on. We persevere, not as a have to, but as a get to. We get to persevere for the glory of our God. We press on because we have been forgiven, because we want to grow, we want to know him better. We persevere because there is great joy in knowing and belonging to the one true God and King. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word from Philippians and and for the example that Paul set for us in what it looks like to press on with you. I pray that as we go this week, you would show us what that looks like in each of our individual situations, what it means to belong to you, what it means to to be your slave, what it means to get to know you better because we've experienced your grace. I pray that we as a people would find all of our joy and all of our hope in belonging to you, the good, just, and righteous King. Help us to do all of this, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit at work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.